أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد فإن الخير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور مهدثاتها وكل مهدثة بدأ وكل بداية ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار uh, Welcome to the new students who are starting this term Inshallah Allah give you success in your studies and Allah make it a benefit for you for your families and for the Muslim Ummah. With the events which have occurred over the past few weeks and months actually, going back to the wildfires in Europe and North America, the loss and devastation of property, livelihoods, life, right up until the earthquake in Morocco and the horrific floods in Libya, in which tens of thousands of people potentially have lost their lives, their livelihoods, and the utter devastation of the infrastructure of those countries. We as Muslims need to understand from the Islamic paradigm the wisdom and the purpose of such events. Because what you tend to find from those who deny Allah and the last day is removing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely from the equation when discussing such events. Because their argument, their understanding is how can a loving God, a God who claims to be merciful, a God who claims to be forgiving, how can a loving, in their words, father do this to his what they say is children. And from this broken argument, they come to the conclusion that there can be no God and such events are just coincidental, are just unfortunate series of events. And they put it to climate, uh, what, what's happening to the climate, and what's happening to the greenhouse gases and so on and so forth. Their argument is incorrect because it is not the existence of God which they are objecting to. It is the wisdom of God which they are challenging. They challenge Allah's wisdom as in why does he allow these things to occur? Why does he allow tens of thousands of people to lose their lives in such offense? Millions more become homeless and millions, millions more become uh, completely impoverished by such events. And especially if you look at Morocco and Libya, we find a population, a civilization, and an economy which was already challenging. The, I, I, SubhanAllah, I had just returned from Marrakesh two or three weeks before the earthquake occurred. And I witnessed with my own eyes the difficulty that the people face on a day-to-day -day basis. So the question arises, why does Allah allow this to happen? The first thing, and in my opinion, one of the most important things to understand is we should not say about Allah that which we have no knowledge. And the example I just gave, we do not accuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of blameworthy acts. And we do not put against him 
accusations which by their very mentioning deserves his punishment and our complete eradication. We only say of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those things which are befitting to him. So for example, you know, one of the one of the accusations against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he has no control over the events which occur in the heavens and the earth. We don't put this accusation against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another accusation which is put at his feet is that he is forgetful, he is weak, he becomes tired. We completely and utterly as Muslims reject the, these accusations. When the Muslim says, Subhanallah, when we glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this statement, what we are saying is every attribute of perfection is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every attribute of imperfection, every characteristic of imperfection, of weakness is completely and utterly removed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, Allah has revealed about himself that he is the most merciful and he is the most forgiving and he is the most loving and he is the most grateful. But along with these attributes, these Jalili attributes, these attributes of beauty, of mercy, are the attributes of Jalal, are the attributes of power, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He is the Almighty. And He is the one who punishes humanity for their sins. And He is the one who will take vengeance. So our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the relationship that we as Muslims build with our Lord is a complete picture. We don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just through his names and attributes of mercy and forgiveness. But we understand that we have a Lord who is not only forgiving, not only merciful, but he, if he chooses, will punish man for their sins. So this is the first thing to mention. And there are many, many verses in the Quran which talk about Allah's greatness and His power and His wisdom and His might and His majesty. As there are verses which talk about Allah's forgiveness and His mercy and His love and His generosity. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we understand our Lord using all of these names and attributes. And to him belong the most beautiful of names and attributes. So that's the first thing to point out and to mention. The second thing to note is that we do not have a symbiotic relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not a relationship that is based upon a partnership of equality. It is not that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in return He will do good to us. Or that we in some way or fashion have a say with regards to how Allah should behave with us and His creation. No, our relationship as is the relationship of the entirety of creation is one of master, he is the master, he is the king, and we are his slaves. And to be an abd of Allah is not to be seen as something which is low, because the most beloved name of to the Prophet وسلم, was Abdullah. He referred to himself as a slave of Allah. And he loved this name. And he loved this term. Because if you are not the slave of Allah, you can guarantee you are the slave of something else. 
if you are not the slave of the one who created you, then you will be the slave to love, to drugs, to sex, to money, to wealth, to fame. You will be the slave of your own desires. You will most certainly be the slave of something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, I ask you, who is it better to be the slave of? The one who created us? The one to whom all of us will return? The one to whom we will seek refuge in on that day? Or to those that have no power in this life, nor will they have any power in the next life? So our relationship is not one of equality, it's not one of symbiosis. It is simply one of master and slave. Allah is the master and we are his slaves. And as the master, he is free to do, now you must understand this. He is free to do with us whatever he wants. In the same way that I am free to do with my possessions, whatever I want, and no one can castigate me, no one can blame me, no one can accuse me, because these things belong to me. In the same way we belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally, our very lives, our bodies, our souls, our wealth, our family, belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is free to do with us whatever he wants. And that is something which we must understand and which we must appreciate and which we must accept. There is no point becoming all haughty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no point becoming arrogant before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he is the one who is all full of pride. He is the one who on the day of judgment will roll up the heavens and the earth in his right hand. And he will say, where are the kings? Where are the tyrants? So we understand we are his slaves. And it is only by his mercy that we obtain any good in this world. Every now and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is becoming more and more frequent. And this is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that one of the signs towards the Day of Judgment is that the number of natural disasters will increase. The number of earthquakes, the number of floods. So this is in a way a wake-up call. When we see these events happening, it should be a wake-up call that we are coming closer and closer to that ultimate day, to the Yawmul Haqq, as the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it. We are coming closer and closer to this day of truth. But also it reminds us how weak humanity truly is and how powerful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly is. He uses whatever it is at his disposal to show to humanity our complete weakness and poverty in comparison to what he controls in the heavens and the earth. So the water which we drink can suddenly become something which brings destruction to humanity. The very land that we build our homes upon becomes the very thing that brings about our destruction. Allah in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he uses whatever he wishes at his disposal to bring about punishment for humanity. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying these events are necessarily punishments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is a very important point. Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will Allah destroy people even if there are good people living amongst them? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes, if the evil, if the wickedness outweighs the good, but each person will be raised upon, on the day of judgment, will be raised upon what they were upon on this earth. 
So if they were good, then they will be raised upon good. If they were evil, then they will be raised upon evil and wickedness. And this is the other point that I want to mention. That we Muslims do not see our existence simply as this life. There is more to our existence. And there is something which is far greater than the world that we're currently living in. And that is the world that we are about to live in. And that is the focus, or that should be the focus, of every single Muslim. Not necessarily trying to achieve the best in this world. However, if Allah gives it to us, then Alhamdulillah. If He gives it to us without us sacrificing our Akhirah, Alhamdulillah. It is a mercy and a blessing from Him. But what is far more important, and in the verse that I recited in the Khutbut al Haja, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not die except as Muslims. Do everything in your power. Not to accrue wealth, not to accrue power, not to accrue, accrue uh, 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 progeny, but do everything in your power to die as a Muslim. Because if we die as Muslims, by Allah's permission, then our next world will become so much more delightful for us. And it will be a world which will be for eternity. There will be no end to it. However, if we don't die as Muslims, if we die upon any other religion other than Islam, and what Allah sent down as the truth, then the only other residence is the hellfire. And that will also be for eternity. So that is why Allah says to humanity, and He says to the Muslims, do not die except as Muslims, because the consequence of that is, is just far too great to, 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 to uh, the consequences are so great that this world will pale into insignificance. One will completely forget about this dunya. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us some insight or as to events which will happen on that day. And one of them will be the individual who will say, why did I not send forth good deeds for my life? And he will understand that his life was not this world, was not the 1890 or even as previous generations lived, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. That was not their life. Their life or our life will be when eternity stares us in the face. That will be our life. That is why Allah says, do not die except as Muslims. So that is our concern. That is our goal. Whether we die as kings or whether we die as paupers, if we die as Muslims, then Alhamdulillah, we have achieved the greatest success, as Allah mentions in the Quran Himself. This is, this is the greatest success. And the greatest failure is the opposite. So every now and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I said, shows to humanity that His power and His greatness and reminds us of our weakness and our poverty. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Another point to to mention is that humanity doesn't have the key to all answers. We don't we are not the fountain of wisdom. All wisdom belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we may not necessarily understand the wisdom behind certain acts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala performs on this earth, but we accept them. And we, we accept them and we uh, 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 do not try to understand them in accordance to Allah's wisdom. Because sometimes we cannot understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we accept that He is the All-Wise and whatever He does, He does it out of His wisdom. 
He does it out of his justice. He does it out of his knowledge. And as for those Muslims who passed away, if you look at it, if you remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which he ﷺ said that whoever dies drowning will die a shaheed. Dies the death of a shaheed. Dies the death of a martyr. He will be resurrected as a martyr. Whoever dies with a building collapsing on top of him dies the death of a martyr. If we put that in relation to the events which have happened around us recently, then we have good hope. Yes, we are sad for those who we lost. And we help those who are left behind. But as for those who have passed away, we have good hope that their death was not in vain. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them something better than what He has taken from them. And that is a resurrection of the martyr. And let us not forget the reward of the martyr. The Prophet sallallahu said, the reward of the martyr are six. At the first drop of his blood, all of his sins are forgiven. All of his sins are forgiven. He is saved and he is protected from the punishment of the grave. He is saved and protected from the terror of the day of judgment. He is permitted to intercede for 70 members. I can't, I, actually, I can't remember the exact number. It's 40 or 70 members of his family. He is given a crown to wear on his head. One jewel, one jewel in this crown is worth more than the earth and everything it contains. So the reward of the martyr is great. And we have good hope that those who passed away in these incidents will be resurrected as martyrs. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember, He doesn't allow good to go unrewarded. And these trials and tribulations, another wisdom of them is that through them, through hardship, we are forgiven our sins. And our status is raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the objective of life. To stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our sins forgiven. If we have obtained that goal, then alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, that when the person who suffered the most hardship in this life, so you can imagine a person a dejected, a pauper, one who was ignored, one who struggled every day of his life, one who wasn't even sure if he was going to eat, you know, or how many times he was going to eat that day. One who was dejected and, and, and forgotten about, but he died a Muslim. Allah will take him and dip him into paradise. And then Allah will take him out and he will ask him, did you suffer any hardship? Did you suffer any difficulty in this dunya? And bear in mind, this is the man who was the most impoverished, who was the one in the most hardship. And just from that experience of being dipped into paradise and taken out, he will say, my Lord, I suffered no hardship. I suffered nothing. And then Allah will take the tyrant king who had everything and who lived a life of luxury. But he died a disbeliever. And he will take him and he will dip him into the hellfire and take him out. And then he will ask him, did you have any enjoyment in this dunya? And bear in mind, he was the king who had everything, who had everything at his disposal and used everything at his disposal. And he will say, I had no enjoyment whatsoever. So imagine living in eternity in paradise. So this is what faces the Muslims, even especially those who have died and passed away in these difficult circumstances. And it's also a reminder to those who are left behind to come together, to help aid and assist, whether it be physically, whether it be financially, whether it be emotionally, whether it be through dua, those who have been left behind and those who are in need, those who have lost their homes, those who have lost their livelihoods, children who have been orphaned, 
It is a time for the Muslims to come together. And Alhamdulillah, I believe that we are the most charitable of people. Not just in Ramadan, even outside of Ramadan. We are the most charitable of people. And it's these times where we come where, when we truly come together and help those less affected that we see this charity, we see this bond of brotherhood and sisterhood and love for the Ummah. So it is an opportunity for us to do good. It is an opportunity for us to share in the barakah and help our brothers and sisters who have suffered greatly uh, through these uh, events. And finally, the last thing I'd like to mention, and there's much more to be mentioned, is patience. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no one has been given a greater gift than patience. And it's at times like this that we truly need to show our patience. Especially in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially in our Lord. And we shouldn't throw up our arms. And we shouldn't ask, what is, why is this happening to us? Why has this happened to me? But rather we don't say anything which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we remain patient and we remain steadfast. Brothers, sorry, can I just ask you to... Uh, come forward, come close. Uh, still, brothers coming in into the main hall. Jazakumullah khair. So we remain patient, and with patience comes the success. Allah mentions the story in the Quran in which the messenger and the believers who were tried and tested to such an extent that even the messenger asked, When will the help of Allah come? But they remained patient, and Allah's response was, Verily, Allah's patience, Allah's help is near. It is qareeb, it is near. It is just a moment away. And we see this throughout the lessons and the stories of the prophets. Just when things were so dire, just when things were, you thought they couldn't get any worse, the help of Allah comes. Similarly, through trials and tribulations, we go through the fire of difficulty in which we are purified. Just like gold needs to go through the furnace to become purified, we, humanity, has to go through hardships to be purified. Because Allah wants to remind us, this world is not your paradise. This world is not the world that you should be seeking. And this world is full of hardship and full of difficulty. Both for the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Everyone faces difficulties. Everyone faces hardship. But And remember the Prophet ﷺ said, this dunya for the believer is like a prison. Because it is hardship after hardship after hardship. And we don't resort to those, uh, uh, those pleasures which are haram. When the Muslim faces hardship, he uses his religion, he uses the teachings of his deen to get him through that hardship. More often than not, when a disbeliever faces hardship, what does he turn to? He turns to women, he turns to drugs, he turns to alcohol. He'll turn to something else other than Allah. And through that hardship, what happens? The Muslim comes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe if we were had too much enjoyment, we would grow further and further. I know definitely from my own experiences, when life is comfortable, I see my relationship with Allah very weak. Yeah, I'll do my prayers, but maybe I won't spend so much time in dua. Yes, I'll give a bit of charity, but only the, the minimum. But when life becomes difficult, then the dua start, and the sincerity starts, and the money starts to flow. And this is human nature, this is our condition. So Allah wants to remind us, this is not your paradise. Your paradise is yet to come. This is but hardship through which you earn your paradise. Through which you earn, actually let me rephrase that, through which you earn Allah's mercy, which will enter us into paradise. Because none of us will earn paradise. What we will earn is Allah's mercy and Allah's forgiveness, which will enter us into paradise. So my dear brothers and sisters, don't be, don't allow events such as this to go by without learning the lesson behind them. And be patient 
upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in front of you. And remain steadfast and help those who have been affected. And remain strong and that will bring about the greatest success with Allah's permission. Finally, a reminder, uh, the, the, the congregation are collecting uh, money for Morocco and Libya and help is needed tomorrow. Uh, can somebody remind me of the time? <coughs> yeah, I have a message here, sorry. Uh, help is needed tomorrow to for fi fund collecting and just bear with me one second. Uh, please make an announcement at the end of the khutbah that today we are making a collection for our brothers and sisters in Morocco and Libya after the recent disasters, as well as donating generously. Don't forget, don't forget them in your prayer. Uh, we are collecting in Stains and Egham. We need volunteers from 9.30 to 5. Please contact Brother Majid, who will guide you. Uh, and also uh, another welcome to our new students. Subhana, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you success in your studies and your existing students, all the Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success in our endeavors and allow it to be a benefit to us, to our families and to the Muslims. And may it be a way for us to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may be a means for his forgiveness. Outside? You want me to pray outside? Okay. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruk wa atubi ilayki kima salam. Allah.